Now, this is Memorial Day weekend, and as we think about those who have died protecting our freedoms in America, we're reminded of the one who came to free us from slavery to sin and its consequences. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins on the cross, and he voluntarily laid down his life to pay the wages of our sin so that we could be saved from judgment and have eternal life. But unlike our fallen American soldiers, Jesus rose from the grave, demonstrating his power over sin and death. And this morning, we're going to look at a very specific example of someone putting their faith and trust in Jesus, even though we don't know his name. We simply know him as the thief on the cross, the man who changed his mind just in time. Now, I've been on numerous short-term mission trips and almost all of them were evangelistic in nature. Now, what I mean by that is that I wasn't there to do a construction project, I wasn't there to lead a vacation Bible school, and I'm not putting those things down or saying that they're not important. What I'm saying is that if you intend to stay dry in a building, you don't want me putting the roof on it. <laughs> Let me give you an idea of what a typical day looked like on one of these mission trips. Let me start by sharing our goal, and actually this was the goal of the church where we were going. Uh, one place that I went often was Paraguay. And Pastor Alcides and his ministry team had a goal of planting churches just outside the reach of the main church. He had identified people within the church to be a part of that church plant, and then people from America would partner with him and his church in sharing the good news in these identified neighborhoods. So we were broken into small teams made up of an American like myself, an indigenous translator because I don't speak very much Spanish, and a Christian from the local church who was going to be involved in that church plant. My ministry was to share my testimony using the translator, explaining how Jesus had saved me. And if they allowed me to continue, then I would share the gospel with them and ask them if they would like to put their trust in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Now, regardless of their decision, we would invite them to join us in the evening at where the church plant was going to be, and uh, we would have a concert or a movie or perhaps a drama. And we would share a testimony again and the good news, followed by an invitation to become a Christ follower. Well, one day I was out sharing the good news with an older man, and when I asked him if he would like to receive God's forgiveness, he said no, that he would rather just take his chances with God after he died. I was a bit stunned because unlike most people, this man clearly understood what was at stake but he chose to trust in his own goodness instead of in the righteousness of Jesus. Most people, when they decline to trust in Jesus' work on the cross, are doing so either because they don't understand or because their heart is so hardened that they don't care. It broke my heart thinking that this man could die without making a decision to follow Jesus and therefore spend eternity in hell separated from all that is good. To be honest with you, when I have shared the good news with people over the years, I have heard no many more times than I have heard yes. But in this one particular incident, it was very difficult for me to hear this older man's rejection of God because I knew that more of his life was in the rearview mirror than through the windshield, if you'll allow me to use that analogy. A younger person might have more opportunities to change his mind. But of course, none of us know the number of our days. Today's scripture made me think of different people who made a commitment to Christ later in life, almost too late. Let me share with you a story not from scripture, but from recent history of a man named Professor Anthony Flew. For much of his career, Flew was known as a strong advocate of atheism, arguing that one should presuppose atheism until evidence suggesting a God surfaces. He also criticized the idea of life after death, the free will defense of the problem of evil, and the meaningfulness of the concept of God. And in 2003, he was one of the signatories of the Humanist Manifesto III. However, in the year 2004, at the age of 81, 
He changed his position. Now, honestly, more than that changed. God changed this man's heart. And he stated that he now believed in the existence of an intelligent creator of the universe, which shocked his colleagues and his fellow atheists. He stated that in keeping with his lifelong commitment to go where the evidence leads, he now believed in the existence of God. The book about his conversion, There Is a God, which is subtitled How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind, was published in 2007. Flew died in 2010 when he was 87, so he almost waited too long. But my experience with the older man in Paraguay also made me think of this particular story in history of the crucifixion and about the thief on the cross. So let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 23. That's the third book in the New Testament. If you'll turn there in your Bibles or turn on your devices and pull up a Bible app, or if you don't have either of those, you can just reach for the Bible in front of you in the pew, and that is on page 830. Luke chapter 23, and we're going to begin at verse 32 because I want to look at the surrounding passage so that we can see the verses that lead up to this point that we're going to be looking at. We want the context. Verse 32. Now, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the, the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. What an incredible lesson the Gospel of Luke gives us from this nameless man's lips. There is no greater example of Jesus' saving grace displayed than to see a common thief, the outcast of society, condemned to die, who came to faith at death's door. To the people who were gathered around at Calvary that day, this man seemed like an absolute nobody. They see him as deserving of his cruel fate. But to Jesus, this man is the epitome, the very reason that he is hanging on the cross. Jesus died for people who were bad, know they are bad, and know they don't have a chance before God if they rely on their own goodness. Luke 15, 7 states, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who need no repentance. Now, if you've ever wondered, are there really 99 people out of 100 that don't need to repent? The answer is that's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is there are 99 people out of 100 that probably feel like they need no repentance. And many people, whenever they hear of the conversion of this dying criminal, remember that he was saved from the very clutches of death. He is often used as a case study for somebody coming to faith at the 11th hour, and honestly, he is. His conversion proves that as long as a person can repent, they can obtain forgiveness. The cross of Christ is still available even to a man hanging, being executed near to his very last breath. The Son of God, the Almighty, was almighty even during his own excruciatingly painful death. 
because Jesus was able to rescue others from the clutches of Satan, the enemy of our souls, even though this man was in the very act of dying. But that is not everything that this story teaches us. And it, should be, it would be sad to look at just this one point and miss everything else, maybe even miss what is most important. I don't think that the only uniqueness about the thief is the lateness of his repentance. First, I think you need to notice very carefully the unique situation <clears throat> and special means by which the thief was converted. This man was a hardened, unrepentant criminal when they nailed him to the cross, because Matthew's gospel says, and the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. We know that by some means, this criminal was converted while he was on the cross, because again, according to Matthew's account, he had very recently been hurling insults at Jesus along with the rest who were present at the crucifixion. So he was unrepentant and hurling insults at Jesus, and then shortly after that was asking Jesus to save him, all while hanging on a cross, waiting to die. Nobody preached a sermon to him. Nobody gave him a gospel tract. Nobody invited him to an evangelistic crusade. And yet this convicted criminal became a sincere and accepted believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you think caused the changed attitude in this thief that led to his repentance. I believe it must have started with the sight of our Lord and Savior. There was, to begin with, our Savior's amazing behavior on the road to Calvary. Jesus was not bitterly complaining about being falsely accused. Jesus was not angry at the way that he had been treated. Jesus did not swear at the soldiers for his harsh treatment. And Jesus did not curse God for the injustice that he was enduring. Perhaps this thief had been mixed up with the worst influences in society, but I am convinced that he had never met a man like Jesus. He had never met someone who endured undeserved treatment with such grace and tolerance and forgiveness. The thief had plenty of time to think or reflect on how the man next to him was acting and reacting but he also had very little time to make a decision because he would most likely be dead by the end of the day. And of course, because he himself was in the throes of his own death, he knew what Jesus was feeling, at least to some degree. Of course, the thief did not know what it was like to carry the weight of the sins of the entire world from the beginning of time until the end. He only knew what it was like to carry the weight of his own sin. And he didn't know what it was like to have God's back turned on him. But Jesus did know that. And still, Jesus never turned his back on this thief. The thief saw the look of pity that Jesus cast on the women mourning him. He saw the forgiveness in Jesus' eyes for those who were mistreating him. And seeing these things, the thief must have been struck with wonder. And maybe that's when it happened. Confronted by righteousness personified, knowing his own heart and seeing his own reactions compared to that of Jesus, his hardened heart softened. I'm sure the thief had never encountered anyone like Jesus before. Instead of justifying himself and his actions, the thief began to acknowledge his guilt. He and the other thief were coarse, rough men who had done evil, possibly even cruel things. But it was obvious that Jesus was different. Even when the executioners drove the nails into Jesus' hands and feet, this crucified criminal must have been astonished when he heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. It must have astounded him to hear Jesus pray for those who were not only putting him to death, but trying to do it cruelly in the most painful way possible. Those thoughts of understanding and forgiveness were certainly not what the thief was feeling or what he would have prayed. When the cross was lifted up, the thief would have seen the inscription above Jesus' head, written in the three common languages in that region, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. He would have been piecing all of this together, 
the very different person next to him, the patient, patience, the forgiveness, the understanding, and then that inscription, so different than anything he would have expected to see placed above a person that has been sent for capital punishment. It was at that moment that divine love began to break through his hardened heart. Even though he had chosen a life of crime, if he had been raised in a Jewish home, he certainly would have heard the prophecies about the coming Messiah. And he read that inscription above Jesus, King of the Jews, and maybe he began to wonder, could this altogether different man be the long-awaited Messiah? He had heard stories of someone performing miracles, restoring sight to the blind, even raising people from the dead. If this man was the one he had heard about, maybe he was the Messiah. As the dying thief watched, he heard people shout, he saved others, why can't he save himself? Even the words of disdain hurled at Jesus, the insults, the sarcasm, the sarcasm from the men killing Jesus, they must have become, those words must have become good news to that man on the cross. And what if he had heard Jesus' own words from the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those executioners, men who became tools of Satan that day, were unknowingly made to be the servants of God. But now let's consider the uniqueness of this man's faith. This man believed in Jesus when he literally saw Jesus dying the death of a felon, enduring the greatest possible personal shame as he hung on the cross. For him to ask Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom, though he saw Jesus was bleeding his life away, was an incredible act of faith. For him to commit his eternal destiny into the hands of Jesus, who, who was to all appearances unable to even preserve his own life, was a great act of faith. Because what the thief saw was really more of a hindrance than a help in his faith journey. Because he saw Jesus in the throes of death, and yet he believed in him as the king who would shortly come into his eternal kingdom. He saw so much through the eyes of faith, even though they had been open for such a short period of time. And then consider the result of that faith. This dying criminal, first of all, confessed the Lord Jesus Christ. And he didn't just confess his faith to Jesus, he also acknowledged Jesus as Lord to the other criminal even rebuking that criminal for reviling Jesus instead of believing in him. This was as public a confession as he could have possibly made. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 10:9 that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The very least that the Lord Jesus can expect of us is that we confess him to the best of our power. This man made as open a confession of his faith in Christ as was possible. And then he rebuked his fellow sinner. He spoke to him in answer to the despicable words this other criminal had hurled at Jesus. We need to recognize that a person who is silent when a wrong is said or done is in fact a participant in that sin. James 4, 17 says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Then we see the dying thief made a full confession of his guilt. He said to the man crucified near him, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we ju indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. When a person is willing to confess that he deserves the judgment of God, that he deserves the suffering that his sin has brought upon him, there is evidence of sincerity in him. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Then we see that he adored and he worshiped Jesus. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus graciously in his darkest hour bestowed a promise to this man's simple faith. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This nameless convicted criminal started his day in partnership with evil hardened in his heart by his own sin, and then was brought into a righteous relationship in his dying hour and was promised eternity in paradise. Let me share with you the testimony of C.S. Lewis. Many of you know C.S. Lewis as the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, but you may not know about his life before he wrote that classic allegorical series of books. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was published when Lewis was 52 years old. The final book in the series, The Last Battle, was published when Lewis was 58, and he died when he was 65. So his classic works were written in the twilight of his life. C.S. Lewis was born in Ireland in 1898, and he had a wonderful early childhood. His older brother, Warren, was his best friend and his constant companion. They played together, they invented games together, they read many books that lined the hallways and the attic of their childhood home. The death of Lewis's mother while he was still young, only nine years old, ended the happiness of his childhood. And tragically, when Lewis's mother died, he in effect lost his father as well. Probably out of an inability to cope with the loss of his wife, Albert Lewis, the father, sent his two boys to a boarding school, whose headmaster, unfortunately, was soon after certified as insane. Lewis had gone to church some in his early life, and he continued to go, at least in the beginning, when he was at boarding school, but that soon ended. And this was the beginning of what Lewis called his atheist phase. Certainly, there were many other factors drawing Lewis towards atheism, One was the attraction to him of the occult. Lewis later stated if the wrong person had come along and influenced him, he might have ended up a sorcerer or a lunatic. Another factor Lewis had to face was the problem of evil. He came to believe that life was meaningless and that we need to build our lives on the basis of what he called unyielding despair. How's that for a life's motto? (laughs) Write that above your, your doorway, right? Unyielding despair, the meaning of life. An experience that finally cured his fascination with the occult was Lewis's personal observation of the of the decline of a friend who had been wounded in World War I and had never fully recovered, either physically or spiritually. That friend became a psychoanalyst after the war and he also developed an obsession with contacting the dead. During a particular 14-day period, Lewis had to physically hold his friend while he kicked and wallowed on the floor, screaming out that devils were tearing him and that he was at that moment falling into hell. Lewis was aware that there could be physical causes for his friend's problems, but he couldn't separate the man's mental state from his passionate pursuit of the occult. So Lewis decided to abandon his own fascination with the occult. Now on the intellectual side of things, author G.K. Chesterton had a significant influence on Lewis. And Lewis began to feel that Christianity was very sensible. Also, he noticed that some of the brightest and most intelligent men at Oxford, where Lewis was a professor, were Christians, and one of whom was a great friend, J.R.R. Tolkien, author of The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So one by one, the arguments that were obstacles to Lewis having faith were being removed. He finally submitted himself to God, describing himself as the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. How's that for a baptism testimony? (laughs) This belief in God happened in 1929, but it was not until two years later that he fully surrendered himself to Christ. Up until that point, it had merely been a 
head knowledge, not a transformation of his heart. Much later, a biographer called Lewis the most thoroughly converted man I ever met. Lewis's journey from atheist to reluctant convert to influential writer to perhaps the most highly regarded Christian writer of our time was something beyond even his own imagination. Now back to the thief on the cross. It may seem unfair to you that the thief on the cross spent 99.9% .9 of his life sinning, doing whatever he wanted, whatever pleased him, and then almost literally at the last moment turns to God for forgiveness and gets the same reward that someone who turns to God in faith at age seven lives in submission to God for 90 years and dies having lived an extremely moral life would receive. Now, of course, it's not the second person's morality that got him into heaven. For both people, it is trusting in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus even taught about this in a parable. And I'd like you to turn to this. It's in Matthew chapter 20. Just go back to the left, two books. Matthew chapter 20, we'll begin at the very beginning of that chapter in verse 1. And that's on page 774 of those Pew Bibles. Matthew chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, uh, don't let that throw you, a denarius is a day's wages, and so that's what we'll call it. So after agreeing with the laborers for a day's wages, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, that would be 9 a.m. because the day started at 6 a.m. when the sun came up. So going out about 9 a.m., he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again at about noon and again at 3 p.m., he did the same. And then at the 11th hour or 5 p.m., he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And then those hired at about the 11th hour came, and each of them received a full day's wages for one hour of work. Now when the hired, those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them received one day's wages. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only an hour one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have been borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Now, let's transition back to our lesson. We've looked at the uniqueness of this man's faith. We've looked at the result of his faith. We've looked at the rebuking of the other sinner on the cross, the full confession of his own guilt, and how he adored and worshiped Jesus. And now we're going to see that the thief brought nothing to this transaction. How often have you heard someone say, I'm sure God will look at my life and that he'll see that I was basically a good person and therefore he'll let me into heaven. Now that's what we would call put my life on the scales philosophy, right? My good deeds outweigh my bad deeds and therefore God will let me into heaven. Other people may assume that God grades humanity on the curve and of all the people who have ever lived, he will let the best 50% into heaven. And then those people compare themselves favorably uh, to people like Adolf Hitler, Jeffrey Epstein, and Vladimir Putin. In Christian circles, this is called the philosophy of works. 
Now, you may be familiar with that term. You may not be able to actually uh, define what it means, or maybe this is something new to you. So let's take just a couple of minutes and talk about what are works. Works are a person's actions or deeds. Work is what we do for some kind of a reward. We work at our jobs, and we expect to receive a paycheck for it. Even working on a voluntary basis has its own reward, praise from others, or a good feeling in your heart for what you have done. In the context of salvation, works refers to the good deeds we do, especially religious or charitable acts, or maybe it's the observance of the Ten Commandments. But what could the thief on the cross have done to earn God's favor? He was literally nailed to a cross and was going to die in a matter of hours. There was nothing that he could do to earn his way to heaven, nothing. Yet Jesus clearly stated that the thief would be in heaven after he died. Now, let me just throw a, a monkey wrench maybe in your thoughts by saying works are required for salvation. But the Bible is clear that those works are the works of Christ, not us. Jesus came to fulfill the law. In Matthew 5, 17, he said very clearly, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have, come, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And Jesus was the only one who has ever lived who could do that. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross reconciled us to God, and as he died, Jesus proclaimed that the work was finished. And now we are invited to enter into God's rest by faith, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Our works do nothing to earn our salvation or even to maintain our salvation. It was the once for all sacrifice of Jesus that justifies sinners. In Galatians 2.16, it says, now that a person is, or know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Jesus and not by the works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. We begin by faith and we continue by faith. Galatians 3.3 3 says, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh or by works? No. Salvation is by grace, which does not even allow works. Grace is by definition unearned, and the Bible makes it clear that God's grace and salvation destroys the argument of any human effort. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. God's requirement for salvation is faith in his son. One of the great themes of the Bible is that we are justified, which means declared righteous, by faith. Faith is the only means of making sinful people able to stand before a holy God. No amount of law-keeping, no amount of good works can accomplish that. If our works could save us, then Christ died for nothing. And if Christ died for nothing, that makes God the Father the most cruel person or human or God or whatever you want to say that ever existed. Works are not the means of salvation, but they are the product of faith. People who have faith in Jesus Christ will be eager to do what is good. The book of James emphasizes the nature of true saving faith as that which results in good works. Faith by itself, James wrote, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And he also wrote, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So if someone claims to have faith yet exhibits no good works, their faith is non-existent. Let me share with you a quote from Charles Spurgeon, known as the Prince of Preachers. He said, whether you are at the earliest stage of life or are within a few hours of eternity, 
If you fly for refuge to the hope set before you in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. No matter what sin has enslaved you for years, the gospel excludes none on the grounds of age or character. You must only look away from your sin and repentance and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That is the message the Holy Spirit yearns to whisper to every heart. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what an example you have given us. And it, it is wonderful that somebody could be saved even at the last moments of their life, even after spending almost their entire life in sin. But God, how much more important it is for us to realize that there is nothing that we can do to earn that salvation. Just as this man hanging on a cross could do absolutely nothing to earn salvation, it was too late for something like that. But it reminds us that it is by faith through grace that we are saved. It is not of ourselves. So Father, thank you for this reminder. In Jesus' name, amen.